Today we're really going to talk about getting the, the best vehicle noise performance you can, doing wind tunnel testing primarily is what the focus of this presentation is. And right away we'll talk about why, why it's important, why we care. Well, this is from a presentation, I think at the last SA Noise and Vibration Conference, the electrification of vehicles from internal combustion engines to EVs really has changed the noise recipe per se that people have to deal with in making their vehicles quiet. And that wind noise that used to be like a 10% factor now is as much as 30% in the overall acoustic field that passengers hear inside the vehicle. So as a company, I mean, Siemens and our Simpson and our portfolio say, well, how, how can we help customers? How can we address wind noise? Well, there's the obvious things like, you know, even in simulation, I mean, we have a computation fluid dynamics code, star CCM plus, you know, what I can do vibroacoustic simulations, right? I can simulate the flow around a mirror over an eight pillar, maybe on the front of a grill, something like that. But doing that type of simulation for acoustic frequencies is very calculation intensive. It could be days or, or more to get a single result. You want to do multiple iterations. You need to get things done quickly in order to change the noise performance for a given vehicle. So we've been focusing a lot, not only in the simulation, but of course in our testing technologies in order to do that, to make it faster, to allow our customers to get you know, hundreds of measurement iterations done in a given shift or given, in a given day in order that they can improve their products faster and save some costs. And speaking of costs, if we look at the classic approach for doing wind noise testing, generally it used to be that, and this is still the case in some facilities, you know, you would have a test session that you're getting ready for where you're going to put together a number of wind speeds, maybe yaw angles on the turntable, modifications, maybe different mirrors, different trim, different door seals, whatever the things might be, make a whole bunch of measurements, post-process that data, spend tens of thousands of dollars for that wind tunnel time. If you got it all right, great. Odds are, though, things didn't go exactly as you expected. You have to come back with a test session number two or three or four or five which can add up into a really high cost for that acoustic wind noise development. The new approach that we're talking about and I'll highlight a lot today says, well, let's get our results immediately such that I can change my test plan as needed during the testing. I might come in intending to do 30 iterations and 10 tests into that realize the next 20 aren't gonna give me any benefit and, and not do anything for making my vehicle quieter or mitigating the issue then. So we wanna get those results faster, make them more accurate, more insightful, so you can really reduce the time it takes to reduce the noise. This whole new approach and just the need for better wind noise performance in general has driven a lot of new wind tunnels to be built in the last few years. This is probably the last five to 10 years in total. So a lot of these new tunnels are being built to do this type of testing, but they needed newer, better, more advanced, I'd say technology in order for the investment they made in the tunnel to really pay off. And some lead customers, like in this case, I'll talk briefly about Daimler in Germany. They worked with us as a lead customer developing some of these new systems that has actually grown into what our wind tunnel aeroacoustic test system is today. Uh, and I've got a quick video to highlight some of that work and really just kind of position what we're gonna be talking about today. So when I play this video, I'll warn you, it's very chunky. It was a fast, highlight video and it went so quickly we couldn't really see the things we wanted to see and what i wanted to be able to point out mostly here is when it pans back is what this arrangement looks like in this tunnel that was developed and was deployed at mercedes-benz research you can see here that the nozzle the open jet of the wind tunnel is in the middle where the vehicle is positioned the vehicle is facing the wrong way technically because i don't think that's the collector side at least i'm not yeah, in fact, it can't because the array is the front. But the point I want to highlight here is that the microphones in the top array, you can see there's 150 plus or minus microphones there. And then each hemispherical side array, all those little black dots are windscreens. And those are individual microphones, 100, 100, 120-ish per side, and then roughly two times that column at the top. These arrays have to be positioned well away from the vehicle in order to be out of any significant wind flow because of course even with the windscreens it would lose the signal noise because of the diaphragm being hit by the turbulent wind and then we have to have a certain microphone density for spatial accuracy frequency resolution things of that nature but that's what i wanted to point out and as a, a facility this one's been operational now for getting close to 10 years actually now i'm going to jump back over here to the screen so there we go all right good so we should be back on the slides now. Overview of the four sections of the presentation really after that brief introduction. We wanna to talk today about 
acoustic testing technologies in general, just what the pieces of the technology are, how we combine those into an integrated solution, and then how we use that integrated solution to let you get the maximum out of your campaign for any given test scenario that you want to do or set of tests that you want to do. So if we focus first on these aeroacoustic testing technologies and zoom in on that a little bit, what we're talking about are really two things, interior wind noise measurements and exterior source identification. Interior noise are things that I think will be obvious to pretty much all the attendees. It could be single microphones positioned inside the vehicle, maybe binaural heads. I can, of course, use those systems to look at narrow band or, or waterfall information to get levels or listen for tones and process looking for peaks in the frequency spectrum. It might give me some idea that there is a problem, but really not how to address it. Taking a further step in interior sound, now this type of measurement with the spherical array, this could be done even in a laminar flow internal where you don't have the acoustic array possibilities exterior. But again, even though it can measure the interior space, and we'll talk about these spheres a little bit later on, it might point you to where the sound source is as far as where it's impinging on the vehicle or coming to the occupants. But again, it, it may not give you a perfect direction as to what the actual source or path is of that sound getting into the vehicle. Now, on the exterior, of course, if you have an open jet tunnel like we saw in that video or in the picture down here in the bottom left over on this side, then we've got the possibility to use acoustic arrays positioned around the vehicle like we see in that photo, maybe surface pressure measurements, uh, localized microphones, potentially measuring things underneath the vehicle from a flow standpoint. And that lets me get a bit more insight into what's actually causing some of my acoustic issues. But now, if we talk then about that 3D array, where it is very useful, kind of things you can get from that. So doing noise source localization and leak detection inside the vehicle can be done very efficiently, where I use a scanning camera, like is shown down here, to literally take a 3D picture of the inside of the vehicle or inside the, the compartment, wherever it might be, it could be an aircraft or, or something else. That view that we see over here is actually like an unwrapped view so I can look at in 2D. Above that is like a 3D model that I could spin around on the screen when I'm processing the data live. All those microphones, in that case, 54 measured simultaneously. We then project the results onto that 3D surface. And there's some special extra processing algorithms I can do, which expand the frequency range or the spatial resolution, the accuracy, I'd say then, of the hotspots that I find. So it can be quite good using a 3D array, but again, it's maybe hard to go fix your issues. Next, if we talk about exterior source localization, again, if I have the uh, aeroacoustic type of tunnel with an open jet, then I can use acoustic arrays, like we saw the, the diamond arrangement, which has this large structure, these wings fold up underneath like this, and the whole thing goes up to the ceiling when they're not using the acoustic arrays. We've deployed others where they roll out an arrangement like this that's roughly the same size as the actual microphone grid shown in the Daimler example. But these types of arrays let me obviously visualize the data projected like for the top measurement down to the top, the top surface of the vehicle or from the side into the side of the car itself. And a very important distinction is that when the vehicle is yawed and turned on the turntable, which is common for these wind tunnels, we actually turn the results with the vehicle as well and do that spatial transform. That's critical to giving the right data results. And you can see even in the, the top down view here of that one to show up in the, the upper right that the, the vehicle is rotated in the camera view so that the sound results then actually still line up with the mirror or maybe the back of the vehicle or whatever the case may be. And then of course, we want a, a quick and easy way to compare those results when I'm actually doing that kind of processing and, and trying to get the, the engineering know-how is to go address and fix the problem. Another thing to consider for doing exterior sound source localization is the possibility for doing coherent calculations. I will have one other example of this later on, but even this one shows pretty clearly that if I take just the standard acoustic array results that are shown in this original picture, it might say that, well, the mirror is a small source, but the bigger source is at the front tire. But if I do a calculation of the coherence to, say, an interior microphone or a driver's right ear of a binaural head, then it tells me that the array results here, coherent with the left ear, in that case, the one towards the window, the noise source at the front tire is insignificant compared to the mirror source. So quite a difference there in the results that you're looking at from the acoustic arrays themselves. It's also possible to propagate those array results onto a 3D model. Those are shown in the, the lower to the left, left photo there where the pointer is. 
And we'll get into evolution of calculation speeds and how we can do this efficiently enough to allow people to make decisions very quickly on the fly during their testing rather than hours or days after they've actually already finished. And the calculations and the, and the additional post-processing, there are things that can be done, of course, to increase the spatial resolution, like we mentioned before, give you a better frequency range or resolution of the actual localized sources themselves. So that really gets into the background of the pieces of the technology that go into the aeroacoustic testing. What we wanna talk about now is what we've been doing for the last five, between five and 10 years to combine all these into an integrated solution to make it as fast and efficient as possible for our customers using the technology inside of Wintel. So we saw this plot before where we talked about the different types of interior noise measurements, exterior noise, and that it can be scalable. What we really focused on was making this an integrated solution so that it could be used very, very efficiently inside the wind tunnel by both the operators and or aeroacousticians. Oftentimes, the actual setup, and there's a nice graphic here I wanted to share, this is going to be similar to what we saw in the Daimler video briefly, but if we look at the pieces that go into this. So in the wind tunnel itself, we've got the vehicle facing into the nozzle, of course, but I have multiple measurement front ends and computers involved because we're talking many hundreds of channels and sometimes it requires more than a single measurement computer all to work in concert. So in the case of one example we'll look at, there's actually a front array at the, on top of the nozzle looking down at the vehicle, array on top straight above it, an array on the left, an array on the right, and the spherical array and or binaural heads inside the vehicle all measuring simultaneously and writing to a central storage database. This gives us the possibility then for online monitoring, real-time visualization of any of the results interior or in the arrays themselves and very fast decision-making from those results, even potentially before a number of measurements are made. One customer like highlighted that they love the fact that even when they're first running a vehicle, sometimes they have to do some shakedown work to make sure they don't have a piece of tape flapping somewhere that somebody didn't leave something loose on the outside of the car or a piece of trim that's rattling. And rather than go make a bunch of measurements before they realize that, they would just look at the live data because they knew that it should be below a certain level at a lower wind speed and they could quickly identify that they need to go fix the vehicle in some way before they could even start their testing. So when we talk about integrated, you know, what, what does that really mean? So of course, in the vehicle, we need to be measuring binaural heads, microphones, or maybe a spherical array all to a front end located in the car. The exterior arrays, in this case, it shows like the, you know, there might be one in the front, the one in red, the yellow one on the top, the blue ones on the left and the right. You know, that could be four individual arrays and or measurement front ends. So there's a fifth front end. Sometimes we're asked to make measurements on the turntable, maybe localized uh, surface microphones like are shown here or pressure transducers or something, you know, underneath the car or around the vehicle, uh, microphones by the tires, for instance. That adds another front end potentially on or around the turntable or maybe even in the traverse. Sometimes they want to have measurement channels in the traverse itself. So what we need to be able to do is have all of those different front ends writing simultaneously, perfectly synchronized to a single database for immediate processing and visualization. And that's what the system is set up to do. And here you can see that you know, we're talking about automated processing, getting results in 10 seconds or less. Sometimes it's even real time on the screen and then data management around that as well. And you have to have this both online and offline, of course, to be able to come back later on and, and look at the data further. So if we talk about a few examples, I get three examples of this integrated solution and why it's important and why it's powerful. So if we take an example of an array and a binaural head and we make measurements with those, of course, from the head, I might calculate something like is shown in this 2D plot for time varying loudness. This is 25 seconds of just loudness. And what's being compared is, if you look over on the right in the pictures, the vehicle with a blocked underbody, you can see the white skirt hanging down and the non underblocked, the standard underbody. And so interior time varying loudness, yep, imagine that there's a difference. I can plot those just over top of each other. As soon as the, the first run is done, I run the second one, and I can see those results comparatively. Similarly, if I'm looking at the side array results, I can see what it looks like. You know, it changes the noise source from blocked underbody to non-blocked. Not a, not a big surprise that way. But you need to be able to quickly overlay these measurements. As soon as you've got that blocking done, the measurement made, you want to know what it is at zero degrees, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, yaw, et cetera. Another example, and here I'll come back again to that coherent analysis that I mentioned earlier. 
it, again, if I'm using the binaural head in an array, in this case, it's a top example of the graphic says left. If I look at the standard top array result for a given wind speed, I'm oftentimes we see something like this where not surprisingly, it's very symmetric. I've got some sources at the mirrors, maybe a little bit in front of vehicle, and then some hot spots on the roof rack. This vehicle has a roof rack uh, that obviously is causing some turbulent flow and noise. And I'm measuring inside the vehicle the binaural head, but what I can do is use one of the ears of the binaural head for a coherent calculation to the array results. So I take the array results standard or just raw from the, the system as it computes normally, and I redo the calculations to only the energy that's coherent to the driver's right ear. And then I see that the mirror sources essentially go away, the ones in the front disappear entirely, and then my roof rack, only the one over to the driver's right, is really significant. And it may seem obvious in this case, but you wouldn't always know, if, is it both roof racks contributing equally to the driver, or is it really one on one side of the vehicle like that that's actually causing more of a noise source? And then similarly, if we do that same type of coherent calculation, but we do it with the 3D spherical array, this gives me the possibility combining that rather than the binaural head in kind of an inverse fashion. So here what I'm gonna do is take my 3D camera results, which, so if you look closely, you can see the vehicle dash. This is again, one of those unwrapped pictures, the 3D pictures, the vehicle mirrors in the front. Those are the A pillars where the noise sources are. And they're, they're rather large. They're actually just saying, yep, you've got most of the noise coming from the A pillar area of the, of the vehicles, what it looks like maybe up towards the top. But I can use the top array result and pick a virtual microphone from the top array results to do a coherent calculation with the 3D results. And then it says, well, okay, not only does the source get much smaller because of the coherent calculation, but it shows me that it's over to the right side of the vehicle there, popped up over to the right side of the vehicle as well is the more significant, you know, of course, when I'm using that virtual source per se in that roof rack. But again, I did that because I did a coherent calculation by neural head to say, oh, my significant issue in this case is maybe the passenger side roof rack. And then I said, let's use this the spherical array to then zoom in on the actual vehicle itself and determine where that leak path is, which might not be directly on the roof rack itself, but I could use the roof rack source as my coherent calculation point. Interesting example of the combining all those technologies. So if we go to our, our second point here about what we do to put all these into a single integrated solution, one thing I wanted to highlight right away, and I think this is not gonna be a surprise to anyone, but you know, we talked to a number of customers when we were first developing the system, and we were hearing things like, hey, we, we're running two shifts, maybe three shifts sometimes, it needs to be super efficient, it's very expensive, you know, if it's not efficient, we can't get the results as fast as we need. People that are renting tunnels want to get the results faster, of course, because that cuts down the rental costs. People that are running the tunnels want to do more tests, maybe have more time to rent it. And so all that ties together, obviously. In a normal aeroacoustic testing campaign, you know, what does it look like? Like how are, how are measurements typically done? I think we just kind of break it down in the big blocks that normally you would have a given modification for a vehicle. Now, a modification could be three different mirror designs. That could be three modifications. It could be a mirror design, but modifications might be taping door seals or putting clay in the vehicle to change flow around a, a component or a piece of trim, something like that. But for every modification, typically you'll measure multiple wind speeds, multiple yaw angles, and you'll pretty quickly start building up a large matrix of test points that you need to have, even for the one modification, right? This can be five and 10 tests per modification quite easily. But while that's ongoing, of course, you want to be able to see the results, think about what's going on, and like I said earlier, decide, do you want to change your intended plan, do different modifications, maybe adapt it on the fly, and do things differently than maybe you intended first going in to do that test. And that's what we really drove the system to be able to do, giving people results faster. Now, if we talk about increasing the test efficiency itself, one other very important thing is integration of the system with the wind tunnel controller. So of course there's an actual control system, a computer and PLCs and the, the large fan and all kinds of safeties built in around running the wind tunnel itself. And it is determining, is it to the right wind speed? Is the yaw angle in the right location? Is the temperature to the right set point, et cetera? We can build a test schedule in a table like is shown here, which might have multiple wind speeds, 
yaw angles all set up in one single table such that it could step through it automatically. And with one click of the go button per se, the person running the system says, I'm ready, go ahead and start. And as soon as the wind tunnel says it's reached the requested condition, we start taking the data. As soon as our five or 10 or 20 second measurement is complete, we tell the wind tunnel, we're all set, go to the next set point. Meanwhile, we're showing real-time visualization of that data and automatically calculating results from that set point and then waiting for the tunnel to tell us, yep, it's back to the next condition. Maybe it's an increase in wind speed or the yaw angle changed. As soon as it says the conditions are stabilized, we make the next measurement and then repeat the whole process. Our automated setups and most of the tunnels nowadays, literally the, the user clicks go one time and then sits back and verifies that a tunnel is getting to the set points and taking data, but he can focus on the results coming in rather than on starting and stopping the test if it's one person doing that. Now we talk about getting the results very quickly, going back between five and 10 years, you know, we were running these all on CPUs. There was some optimization done to make that a little faster. But then once we moved to the graphics processing unit, there were some big strides made. And then if you look back to the 2012 to even this is only up to 2016 timeframe, it went from 250 seconds down to 10 seconds. At one point, you might say, well, why does it matter really that much to go from five minutes to 10 seconds, or even today's is probably like one second? Well, the reason is that matrix we talked about. It's very common to be made your different modifications, your different wind speeds, different yaw angles. You can get into the hundreds of measurements very quickly. We can do that very efficiently by that integration with the test cell controller, the wind tunnel controller. And so if you get 100 plus measurements done in a given day, the old calculation speed was 22 hours worth of compute time. So guess what? You don't see the results till the next day. Maybe you see some of your early stuff before you leave for the day, but you're not gonna make decisions on the fly with that. Now, all those calculations can be done in just over one hour, and they're done automatically at the end of every measurement. So you'll be seeing results from the most previous set point, the most recent modification, before you even go to the next one. So how do we address that? That's actually done through where you can set up a standard set of processing that you always do. We have a number of customers who say that they always want to do a basic wide frequency range on their, say, side and top arrays and calculate interior loudness from the binaural heads. Maybe they use the spherical array all the time, some of the time. A lot of customers now are actually using it the majority of the time, surprisingly. Those standard things that you always test, you set up the processing one time, and every time a measurement finishes, the computer kicks off and runs that processing such that it's available very, very quickly. Like we said, five, 10 seconds per, per one of these kind of arrays. And then you can overlay that with your next run, you know, as soon as that run is getting completed. And the way it's done in the processing software and the setup is that you pick which data you're going to process. So the configurations, the yaw angles, the speeds, which arrays you might be focusing maybe on the left side of the vehicle, or maybe you're only looking at the top because you've got some roof rack issue like we saw in that one vehicle, the frequency and time steps, and then when you kick it off, they go from yellow to green as they're getting computed. Even if you're looking at the displays doing the post-processing, as more results are computed and made available, you'll get an indication where a button will change up here in the upper left so that you know you have new results available. You click refresh and you can automatically update displays. But in the post-processing, we handle this in a very automated fashion as well. We're working from the top to the bottom over on the left you pick the projects or vehicles. So a project's overall could be, you know, vehicle A, vehicle B, but then each vehicle has a number of modifications. Those modifications, like I said, could be different mirrors or, or seams that are taped or clay applied to the vehicle, whatever that is. Then you've got a table for the test conditions, wind speed, yaw angle, et cetera. And then on the bottom, the type of processed data you want to compare. So this could be array results like we see here where I'm, I'm showing for a given modification, the results for the same vehicle at zero and 10 degrees yaw. And when I pick that in these panels on the left, the displays automatically update with whatever type of result that I wanted to see. It could be 2D plots of interior loudness or a sound quality metric or the arrays or a combination thereof actually. Very efficient way to view and compare the results. And like I said, as, as other things are being computed, you click refresh, you get like one more line or essentially another line of checkboxes. You click on that checkbox and boom, that data is overlaid or replaced to whatever you want and the displays over on the right.
pretty an interesting uh, way of handling huge volumes of data very quickly and efficiently without having to search through folder structures, drag and drop curves, or numerical results, things of that nature. So we talked there about the things that we've done in the specialized software for getting the maximum out of the test campaign, right? You've got 100 to 150 tests or configurations running in a given shift. How do you see those results and use them in order to reduce the number of uh, modifications that you even have to test in order to make things as efficient as possible? And then lastly, a quick section here about you know, why, why I think Siemens really should be the trusted partner for this type of testing. All of these wind tunnel deployments are done as customer specific projects where we have a deployment team that has done this you know, north of 10 times now worldwide. It's a customized solution. That's very important because every wind tunnel is different. The shear layer of the air coming out of the nozzle comes out at different angles to based on the size. There's only so much room between the shear layer where we can't put microphones where the arrays can sit. So there's a finite size to the arrays, the distance of the arrays from the vehicle, more microphones required, the spatial action required, all those are variables that we have a lot of experience in customizing and optimizing for different customers in order to give them the best possible bang for their buck, really. Because if it was an infinite amount of budget, you could keep throwing more microphones at it to a limit, of course, and get diminishing returns as far as the accuracy. So oftentimes there's interaction between, okay, what, what's a budget level for? Is it 100 microphones, 200, 500, 1,000? is in order to get the specifications that the customer wants. And then we also, because we're Siemens and we have a large, large company and organization worldwide, there's local support in all the different countries. So whether you're in US, Canada, Brazil, Europe, Asia, all these wind tunnels that have our systems, we have local support teams there that can help interact and, and work on anything from hardware calibrations or issues to helping install and configure the software, et cetera. And then really the other thing is, as far as Siemens and working with us as a trusted partner, this isn't like where it ends for us. We have a lot of other things going on. Everything from, like I mentioned, you know, the, the CFD kind of results to research we're doing in underbody, upper body, interior noise measurements. We've been doing a fair bit of work in the area of understanding flow underneath the vehicle and how that can relate to lower frequency noise sources and ways to measure that, maybe create a ways to kind of map that pressure surface underneath the vehicle and understand how that's causing noise impingement inside the passenger compartment. A lot of work in the area for noise transfer path functions, including these exterior acoustic arrays. We look at kind of the source path receiver, something we talk about a lot. Of course, there are the things that, like the acoustic imaging, you know, the upper and underbody, like I mentioned a second ago, or standard arrays, but everything from reconstruction turbulent fields, empirical turbulent modeling, interior acoustic uh, imaging, not only the spherical array, but maybe some acoustic modal analysis, I'll show in a second. And then we're continuing to extend the technology to be able to do things like wind noise specific transfer path analysis to understand the exterior sources, be able to do TPA style of calculations with wind noise results. And then simulation, of course, because we're part of the Sim Center family, tying that into simulation results or using some of the acoustic array results to either correlate or increase the accuracy of the simulation models is being done quite heavily inside the organization as well. Other areas that are maybe not perfectly wind tunnel specific, but still relate to interior acoustics, things like acoustic modal analysis. So that's using everything but our standard quote unquote measurement front end, but possibly Q source. Like there's a little video here showing of a, a point source that we have. That object is, is like the, I don't know, the size, maybe the length of a football, but not, not that big around. It is a point noise source. So it can be used both inside and outside the vehicle to do noise transfer path analysis calculations. Uh, and sometimes that can be used in order to understand those paths, like we mentioned, even with the wind tunnel array results. Similarly, if we look at acoustic modal analysis, possible to make measurements at multiple planes inside a vehicle and then have the ability to animate those mode shapes. So I think this might be a little chunky on, on your end to the, the webinar. But, you know, is it, a, is it a standing mode or a whole signal mode side by side, you know, quote unquote torsion inside the vehicle? That can also help you diagnose, uh, maybe you're working on you know, from or boom or window open kind of issues, things of that nature. And that pretty much wraps up the overall information we wanted to share today. I really appreciate everybody's time. I wanna say thanks for, for attending today and letting us talk about our aeroacoustic wind tunnel measurement system and what we've done to kind of bring about state of the art. My name is Jason Wayman, as we said, my email address is there. Thank you very Great. much.